In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, we gather in your name once again. Please keep our eyes open and our ears open, our hearts open, and our minds open so that we might learn what you have to teach us. We ask all this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, welcome to the third session of The Long Road to Vatican II. Speaking of long road, I was going to a legal seminar this morning and uh, was almost there, was running a little late, and there was a roadblock, you know, and, and somebody came up by the window and tapped on the car window, and they said, uh, I rolled down the window, and I said, what's going on? And they said, well, there's been a terrorist attack. A bunch of terrorists have collected a bunch of lawyers at the seminar up the road there, <laughs> uh, and I was glad I was late. Uh, and uh, they've threatened, you know, they wanted a million dollars, otherwise they're going to douse the lawyers with gasoline and light them on fire. And so we're taking up a collection. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll be happy to contribute what's, you know, what's usually be being given. And uh, the guy said, oh, a gallon or so. <laughs> so um, with that, I did want to remind you that this is uh, not fire and brimstone, but rather a Lenten program. And I wanted to uh, remind you that the program is called The Long Road to Vatican II. And uh, I think I've mentioned uh, as a general MC for, the other, for other parts of the program that you know, this is kind of uh, post or pope ex facto, perhaps, that the pope has, has designated this as a year of faith. And we're supposed to study the documents of Vatican II. And in listening to the presentations thus far, you know, there's a couple of them that I think are really kind of good reading for Lent in any event. The first one that I, I really would like you to read if you have, uh, you know, the inclination to do any homework for one of these programs is uh, the Decree on the Apostolate of the Laity. It's really a great thing for Lent. Uh, basically, it says, you know, the clergy provides grace to us through the sacraments, and we're supposed to take that grace, and we're supposed to take it out into the world and use it for, you know, not only for our individual lives, but as parents and spouses and in the workplace and the rest of it. And that particular uh, Vatican, II doc Vatican II document is really excellent. It really is good for Lent. I'd really recommend that you do that. For tonight's program, because we're going to be dealing with the Reformation, there's two other um, things that we really should read, and you're all adults here. It's, it, you know, it's uh, something that you can certainly uh, consume and enjoy. The Decree on Ecumenism is one, that is how we get along with other Christians, and the Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christians. Uh, if you watch the news and you watch international relations and so forth, Vatican II has something to say about how we should be treating other religions as well, and of course the Constitution on the Church. So these are things that are going to relate to the presentation I'm going to make tonight. It would relate to the things that Professor Noble talked to you about and the Bishop talked to you about. All right. I mention that because, you know, the environment that we're in here, uh, there's some demographics we should be aware of. Here in the world, Christians are about a third of the world's population, about 2.1 or 2.2 billion people. Muslims are about 21 percent, about 1.2 billion people. And there's all these other people as well. And if you look at the forms of Catholicism, here in the graph, here is the number of Catholics versus Protestants in the various continents. In North America, you can see here, there's 84 million Catholics in the United States currently. There are 60 million Protestants and another 70, that 71 million uh, who are uh, related to that. So there's about two to one Protestants to Catholics in the United States. Another thing that we should be aware of is that if you look at Latin America, how many Catholics are there compared with North America? Kind of an astounding number. And if you look at the number of Protestants in Latin America to Protestants in North America, once again, 
it's comparable. And in Europe, you can see 276 million. I don't know how many of those actually go to church, but this is by self-identification compared to how many in North America. Or how many in Africa compared with North America. So uh, the numbers of Catholic denominations, Catholic versus Protestant, if you want to say versus, I'm not sure it's appropriate, but uh, this is a part of the world that we live in and we ought to be aware of it as we go through our days. In the United States, the number of Catholics by population is about 23%. Mainline Protestants are about 18%, and Evangelical Protestants are about 26.3%. That would include all of the denominations that are listed underneath here. So, um, I heard a talk one time by David Foster Wallace. He was addressing a college class. And it, the theme of his presentation was uh, a story that he told at the very beginning, where there was kind of uh, two junior fish swimming through the ocean by the coral, and going the other direction is kind of a, a senior fish, kind of been around for a little longer, and he poses a question to the two junior fish who swim by, how's the water, boys? And after he passes by, one of the younger fish says to the other one, what is water? And I, that's one of the questions that we could ask ourselves. Here we're in the United States of America. This country was established by who? The Puritans. The Puritans, of course, were kind of the radical Protestants who couldn't get along uh, with the governments in Europe and wanted to come here. But what they didn't like was that back in Europe, they were too Catholic. And it was a capital offense to bring a Catholic into North America back then. Uh, and, you know, it was only until the potato famine, I'm glad to say, you know, that a substantial number of Catholics actually uh, grew in the population. So that is the, the society, that's the culture that we're in here. And so going back to that Reformation era and looking at the Catholic part of that is something that we as educated Americans, as educated Catholics, should know something about. The title that I gave this is Reformation from the Bottom to the Top, and that was quite deliberate. That was not a mistake. Usually when people talk about the Reformation, they talk about all the scandals that were going on at the papacy and the papal court and what was going on in Rome and so forth. And you don't hear very often what was going on at the lay level. And there's been a lot of research, particularly recently in the last 50 years or so, that really have changed the idea of what went on in the Reformation and what it really was. And I want you to know as I bring this to you tonight, I told the lawyer joke at the beginning because I'm sort of an evidence-based person. Uh, and I'm going to try and give it to you as the evidence presents itself, uh, as Professor Noble would give it to you, uh, as Professor William Cook would give it to you from New York University, or uh, Dr. Gregory also from Notre Dame who teaches the a course called Christianity in the uh, Reformation Era. So I'm going to give it to you as a layperson, as I understand it. And you know, the first slide that I had on there had a lot of distinguished people and then it had me up there. But uh, the one advantage I have is I sit where you do. And once I learn this stuff, I kind of approach it as I, I would if I were sitting in any one of your seats. So as we go through there, I'm going to give it to you as straight as I can. All right, these are lovely pictures that we'd ordinarily identify with Catholicism, uh, the highest form of Catholicism. Look at the dates. The dates are 1505 to 1626. These are essentially the dates that St. Peter's Basilica, Basilica was constructed, um, the Vatican City was constructed, and so forth. Look at the dates for the next slide. 1517 to 1648. Very similar dates. What was going on in other parts of Europe when they were constructing that basilica and the rest of Vatican City was the, what many people call the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther tagged uh, the uh, door in Wittenberg at the castle uh, church there 
in 1517. Look at the difference in the appearance of inside churches that, that was de de developed there. Look at what happened to the map after that, during that same period. Large swaths of Europe turned from Catholic to Protestant. Europe had 200 years of, of Catholic versus Protestant war and Protestant versus radical Protestant war. Religious war was rife in Europe for 200 years. So what you see going on in the Middle East is really not that different from what went on in Europe. Uh, the figures, the main figures we're going to talk about, of course, is our Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. These are kind of the uh, rock stars, if you will, of the Protestant movement during that time period. Once again, look at the contrast between what was being built in Rome and what that cost while the other half of Europe you know, was being lost to Roman Catholicism. One of the really important things that we should all be aware of is language. When I went to Bishop Knoll and uh, when I went to Wabash College after that, I always heard about the Protestant Reformation. When you think about those words, uh, Reformation presumes that there's something to be reformed, that there's something corrupt that needs to be fixed. And by the term Protestant Reformation, and this is the way a lot of people think of it in the United States, it means the Protestants address those issues. And usually you hear with reference to the Council of Trent and other things that happened in the Catholic Church, well, that was the Catholic Counter-Reformation. That brings up in people's minds ordinarily that it wasn't in favor of or positive towards Catholicism, but rather it was a reaction, a negative towards the Protestant Reformation. The research that I talked about at the beginning really shows that before the Protestant Reformation, there was already a Catholic Reformation going on in the church. And that continued through the Council of Trent and really flowered after the Council of Trent. When you talk about and think about the Reformation era, you have to think about two issues. One is, why did the Protestant Reformation take place? Why were people dissatisfied? Why did they want to change so radically and change the doctrines of the church as well as the leadership? That's one issue. And the other issue is, if it was really as bad as that, why didn't everybody change? What was the reason for the persistence of Catholicism in Europe and the rest of the world? And did this represent a division in Christianity? Well, uh, last week particularly, you, you heard lots of deep, dip, different divisions of Christianity. There was a division between East and West, West Orthodox and Roman Catholic. There was a diff the Great Western Schism when we had two or three popes at one time and we also had two or three councils going at one time. Um, there have been a long history of challenges that we call her heresies now. Christianity has always had some divisions. So is this really the, the division of Christianity is one of those terms that we ought to be sensitive to when you read articles or get in discussions about that. I mentioned something about the Catholic Reformation. Two of the big figures that you might think about is Thomas More in England and uh, Erasmus uh, from uh, what became the Netherlands. Both of these people, Thomas More wrote Utopia. Utopia is a critique of the society and the church at the time. But when Luther broke with Rome, of course, Thomas More was one of the leaders of the Catholic movement in, in England. Erasmus was called the Prince of the Renaissance. He was a Christian um, that really took Reformation inside the church seriously. And we'll talk about him a little bit more. But of course, he wrote something called In Praise of Folly. The young lady who went around Europe observing things very naively saying, oh, isn't that fine? And of course, it was very satirical. It's still really funny today if you want to read that. So we have individuals, famous individuals, most of you have probably heard of, already looking at changes, reformations within the Catholic Church before Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door. All right. 
And as long as we're going to talk about um, definitions of terms, let me use this particular term tonight and define it this way. So when I use this, you will know uh, what I'm talking about. The term heresy is thrown around. Usually it means somebody we don't like or somebody lost in, in, in the battles of history. But what we're going to do here tonight is we're going to use that as uh, somebody who deliberately holds beliefs that contradict church-defined Christian truth. Now, if you have somebody who's ignorant about what the truth is, who has a superstition about it, or is an unintentional error, or they're a Jewish or Muslim or something like that, that's not heresy. Uh, the approach to heresy, and this is borne out by the research that I talked about before, it wasn't like uh, they were looking for per people to burn at the stake. The first approach was to instruct heretics, uh, to try to correct them so that they actually understood what the Christian truth was and get that corrected and get guidance. I have to let you know that this term is applicable not only for the Catholic Church but for Protestants as well. The Protestants from, from the earlier portion of the uh, Reformation uh, were, there was an immediate division in Protestantism and there was a group called the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists we can also classify as sort of radical Protestants and by that what I mean is these were folks who did not support the government and were generally persecuted by the government as well whether it was a Protestant government or a Catholic government. So that term, that idea of ca uh, capital T truth is something that was applied by Catholics, Protestants, and radical Protestants during this period. By the way, the cartoon says, okay, all signs sealed and delivered, now you can take it back to the herd and tell them to relax. Okay, what we have to do a, a little bit here is we need to look at the context in which all of this happened. Uh, this would be what is referred to as the late medieval period. It's what happened before the year 1500. Thomas Hobbes described the period as uh, life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And I think that's really an apt description, uh, beside the fact that Thomas Hobbes lived well into his 90s, so you have to worry about that a little bit. Most people, 90% of the population, were engaged in agriculture of one sort or other. Um, the mortality rates from all sorts of causes, including war and disease, were extremely high. Infant mortality rate at that time was about 35 percent. Half of children born didn't li live until the age of 50. Um, there was my uh, favorite subject of mine, the Black Death that happened in 1348, that over the course of three years, 25 to 40 percent of the population died. And of course, that had really radical impacts on society, on economics, and on religion. The uh, societies were essentially broken up into three categories. Those who fought, those who worked, and those who prayed. And once you were in one of those categories, it was hard to get out. There was not much social mobility. The political situation really plays an important part in the Reformation. There were monarchies, there were em empires, and then there were city-states. The city-states, by the way, Venice and uh, uh, Genoa and a lot of the it Italian um, commercial states treated their surrounding territories sort of like colonies. Uh, but on, on the large scale, we have to think about Tudor England. That would be Henry VIII etc. There is Valois, France, uh, and they were surrounded essentially by the Habsburgs. There are Habsburgs ruling Spain, there are Habsburgs ruling, ruling the Holy Roman Empire. And so Catholic France was sort of at loggerheads with Catholic Habsburg Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, at one point there, Valois, France made a treaty with the Turks against the Holy Roman Emperor, just as a matter of a political uh, move. So the, these conflicts on a grand scale uh, really had an impact, and we'll see how that works into the, the Reformation era, era later. 
As I told you, I'm going to try to present both sides. I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm going to just give it to you as straight as I can and kind of summarize it uh, for you so that you'll have this context. All right. I call this the bad news for the good news. Right. The first real problem that was, was presenting itself in Europe was anti-clericalism. What was resented was the privilege and abuse of privilege that it was a perception that the, the clergy was undertaking. Uh, the reasons for this are quite concrete. In medieval uh, Europe, the clergy was exempt from taxes. Uh, there is a religious tax called the tithe, which usually was about 6 to 8 percent of somebody's income. And in uh, times of real stress, uh, this was not a time when the food supply was regular. You had uh, civil taxes and you had religious taxes uh, and so forth, and so that could be a real burden. Uh, the clergy was exempt from civil duties. Remember, this is a time when there's no fire departments, there's no police departments, and people took turns watching you know, the gates overnight for the towns. They had to do fire duty and so forth, and the clergy was exempt from this. Um, if a priest, for instance, was accused of theft, he was exempt from civil courts. He was tried in an ecclesiastical court. And you can imagine if that happened with accusations today, what would happen? All right. Uh, there was inconsistent morality in the, uh, in the clergy. Um, the idea of whether priests or bishops or popes had children or were celibate or not, uh, that was kind of not a major point of being a priest, a bishop, or a pope during that time period. Priests were generally uh, not much better educated than their flock. So uh, for them to do any pastoral care, to explain doctrines of the church and so forth, was very difficult because there was no system for educating priests. But the thing that really presented the biggest problem was the allegation of clerical greed. Uh, some people resented the fees for services. Uh, there was sale of the clerical offices. And some bishops had, and, and priests as well had multiple parishes or mul multiple dioceses, and they were essentially um, absentee landlords. They'd collect the money from those places, but they wouldn't provide the pastoral services. Now, this was not a movement. This was a general feeling, and it was stronger in some places than others. The place where this feeling of anti-clericalism was the strongest was Germany. Well, why Germany? Well, you remember the history between the Romans and the Germans, okay? Uh, the, the German provinces were very far from Rome, and the German people had the idea and the feeling that Germany was a place where the, uh, you know, the hierarchy would come to collect taxes to go to spend in Rome. So that generated a lot of resentment. All right, what else was going on? Bad news for the good news. There is ecclesiastical institutional problems. And let me explain this as best I can. The rate of literacy was extremely low at the time. So if you had any kind of education, which a lot of the higher uh, clerical offices did, people in those offices would need, or, or people who were on the secular side would need those people to also do things for the society in general and the, and the political system in general. So there's often times when church officials would be asked and actually did, uh, you know, wear two hats. Uh, they would be part of the ruling elite and they would be part of the religious elite at the same time. There was some conflict between the parishes and the religious orders, monasteries and so forth. The conflicts had to do with uh, who had jurisdiction to preach to the people? Who had the responsibility and ability to collect the tithe from them and use that money? So there are those kind of conflicts. And there was secular control of many of the church offices. A lot of this, by the way, was you know, good um, people from the secular side wanting to get good religious people for their own populations. 
uh, but lots of times this was simply a matter of control. Uh, remember, Professor Noble talked about the Western Schism, that time period when there was multiple popes, one in Avignon, one in Rome, uh, and of course when the pope was in Avignon, he n nominated French clerics, cardinals, w which controlled the, the political system as well as the religious system, and of course the pope in Rome did the opposite and was controlled by the Holy Roman Emperor to some extent. So there was this this political interplay uh, that really made the Western Schism more than just a religious uh, travesty. Professor Noble also talked about conciliarism. Uh, one thing that he didn't mention was that one occasion when the, the council decided that, and there was all French cardinals, uh, that they were going to have a particular uh, rule where they were going to have the councils over the Pope and when other cardinals got there from places other than France then they set off and made their own council and had the opposite uh, result. At the uh, Council of Constance they did solve that problem and get down to one Pope again but they declared that uh, the councils were going to be superior to the Pope in faith, morals, and schism. So uh, that was reversed in, at the Fifth Lateran Council, but you can see that there's conflicts within the institution uh, that really are going to cause problems later on. Now, some of the good news that was going on. There were individuals who were uh, criticizing what was going on, what, what was wrong with the church, and what was wrong with society. One of those people that uh, was fairly early on was a guy by the name of John Hus. He was from Prague, which is, you know, Czechoslovakia, I guess you'd say. His criticism of the church was that, you know, we have these payments for indulgences. He said that churchmen really shouldn't be involved in crusades. They shouldn't be fighting wars for the papal states, that sort of thing. Um, and he was, uh, you know, his criticisms were well taken, but he had to present them at the Council of Constance. Uh, he was under a, from the Holy Roman Emperor, he had gotten a safe passage to present his case to the Council. But after he got there, the Holy Roman Emperor withdrew it. He was condemned as a heretic and burned at the stake. As a result of this, all of Bohemia sort of revolted. Uh, and actually, there were five crusades sent against them, and the Hussites, the Bohemian Hussite church, defeated all of them. So they actually had to sit down and talk with them eventually. One of their big things was they thought that the laity should be able to receive communion in both species, you know, bread and wine. So we have that early reformer. Uh, we also have probably the most one of the most famous uh, preachers at this period of time was Savonarola. He was a real firebrand. Uh, you know, he thought the end of the world was, was nigh. Uh, he talked about clerical corruption, the papal court. He thought that perhaps the pope was a, an antichrist. Uh, that won't get you brownie points at the Vatican. Um, and he also talked about exploitation of the poor, and he said, you know, the same people who were in the upper echelons of the church are the same people, same families, upper echelons of society. Uh, he was also burned at the stake. So uh, the early individual things uh, were, were tough, but some, when you look at some of those criticisms, uh, and then what happened at Trent, uh, you think some of those criticisms perhaps were well taken. Here's the part that I wanted you to understand I'm not up here uh, you know, as a propagandist for Catholicism, although you know, here I am in St. Paul Church. I'm, this is something that if I heard it, I thought, oh, come on. But this is really what the research is showing. Before the Protestant Reformation, the regular laity in the church all across Euro Europe were extremely active. They were extremely interested in their own spiritual welfare. The evidence for this sort of thing is that coming right up to the uh, Protestant Reformation or the Reformation, the investment by the laity, 
of charitable gifts and so forth was at a height, not at a low point. If one thought that the laity was not interested in Catholicism anymore, uh, certainly they were contributing, and they were contributing very, um, very freely. And that is, this was not a matter of imposed uh, contributions. This is on their own free will. In England, for instance, uh, between 1500 and 1600, a full 60% of the churches were either constructed or reconstructed by lay contributions. The laity in various areas would actually hire good preachers, mendicants and other preachers to come so that they would get proper spiritual instruction. In 1517, the year that Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the uh, door of the church in Wittenberg, that was the high point for endor in, um, endowments for masses. That was the high point for people paying for masses for themselves, for the family, for uh, people who had passed away. And there was something called confraternities that were groups of laity that were interested in living their Christianity and living the, their Catholicism in an active way. This included groups that were dedicated to caring for the sick, for education. Uh, there are groups that uh, uh, helped people who were going to go to the scaffold and were in jail. Uh, so they had, and there was a wide range of this, and this was run by lay people, although there were some priests mixed in there too. This was because at the time, Catholicism was truly, it was, it was the social fabric. It's what held uh, the, the society together. This was a society based on faith, and that's, they had limited access to sacraments. At this point in time, laity generally were, were encouraged to go to communion once a year and go to confession in anticipation of that once a year. And so they found other ways to express their Catholicism. Another one of the things that was already developing before the Protestant Reformation was that there was a development in the um, orders, the religious orders, of so-called observantine movement. That is, there were reforms within the, the groups of uh, brothers and nuns to try to go back to their original roots, to become more observant of their order, uh, of what they were supposed to be about in the first place. And this happened across the board, to the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Augustinians, uh, and the contemplatives as well, the Benedictine Cistercians and Carthusians. There's one other factor that I wanted to uh, talk to you about here, if I can get back here. Um, do not think of this in terms, just because it has the word humanism in it, this is not secular humanism. This was a time of Christian humanism. Rosie, did you have a question? I don't know the answer to that one. It didn't show up in the research as to, uh, but I do know that they did all sorts of religious activities. Um, they participated in Saints' Days festivals. There were, um, you know, they'd go to the sites for saints and, and they uh, did things to honor relics and, and on Saints' Days. The whole calendar for these people, their, their life rhythm revolved around the liturgy around saints days and that sort of thing. All right, if I can, let me go back to Christian humanism here. Okay, there was a movement, this was mostly in Northern Italy, uh, of Christian humanists. The idea of this was that there was the feeling that both Greek and Latin had fallen into disuse. Um, there was lots of superstition and ignorance and the way to get around that was to go back to the original sources, uh, refresh Latin, refresh Greek, uh, which was in poor state even in the universities, and scholasticism, you know, uh, the interest in uh, Aristotelian logic and so forth, was getting sort of intellectual and sort of uh, removed uh, and abstract from real life. So the idea here for these Christian humanists of which uh, Erasmus is probably the best known, um, 
was to go back to the sources. Uh, Erasmus actually had developed a polyglot Bible where he had the original Greek and then Latin and then the uh, language of the people in the area so that you could follow the translation across. And it was really a great improvement. He tapped sources who knew their Greek and, and refreshed their Latin. And so the whole idea of this was, let's get back to what the Bible actually says. We'll correct the, the misinterpretations and, and uh, bad translations and look at the church fathers again and get back to what the meaning of our faith is. The idea was that uh, if this was done, then regular lay people could all participate in a knowing way. They wouldn't just punch the ticket and go through the motions. They'd actually know what they were doing. Um, so let's review then, before we go on, uh, the causes of, the, of what we refer to sometimes anyway as the Protestant Reformation. Number one, we had the anti-clericalism and resentment of privileges. That was particularly strong in Germany, or what was going to become Germany, by the way. It was really the Holy Roman Empire. Um, there was resentment as to financial and power abuse. There was inconsistent morals and going through the motions as far as faith goes. Um, as I mentioned before, this was all very uh, geographically specific. There were some places in Italy, for instance, that never went through this. Uh, Anti-clericalism never really developed. And other places such as northern and eastern Germany where it was very strong. If your local priest was a good priest, you wouldn't come across these problems. But there were a lot of bad priests out there who were not well educated. Um, on both sides, both on the Protestant side and the Catholic side, the laity was very interested in their own individual salvation. And that was because at this point in time, there was an awful lot of talk about this is the end of the world, it's coming, you know, after the plague and all that stuff. These were things that uh, people were very concerned about, about their own individual salvation. And that's a little bit different than what it had been before when it was more group oriented. And as I said, that Christian humanism, when the Bible was put into the hands of everybody without instruction, then that did cause some problems. Even though the, the original idea was explicit faith, that is, have people know what their faith is about. Okay, this is the other side of the coin. The causes of the persistence of Roman Catholicism. Number one, there was already substantial reform movement going on. Number two, there was real vitality at the lay level. And the, the commitment was shown in these confraternities, which kept on growing and become, becoming more and more vibrant. Uh, the evidence of that is the investment that was going into church projects, and this was voluntary. You know, people don't uh, contribute to things that they don't believe in, so I think this is pretty good evidence. The central doctrines uh, did not change. People maintained their faith in their beliefs in spite of what was going on in the papal court. Uh, and once again, I mentioned this already, pe the rhythm of people's lives at this time was really centered around the church. That is, those litur liturgical cycles, the saints' days, and, and other religious festivals really kept the rhythm for this society. And there was an active growth in religious orders. This is all at the same time that the Protestant Reformation was proceeding. Well, we better talk a little bit exactly about what the, uh, uh, the first part of the Protestant Reformation was really about. Martin Luther, all right. He was an Augustinian monk, and surprisingly, perhaps, he was in one of the observantine divisions of the Augustinians. That is, he was in one of the more rigorous and more committed to the original uh, idea of the Augustinian order. He was a professor uh, at the University of Wittenberg. Now, as we look at it in hindsight, you know, we all know Wittenberg and think of a university. This was not the University of Paris. This was not the University of Bologna. This was Podunk U. The, anyone have an idea as to what the population of Wittenberg was? 
5,000. Okay? So uh, this is something that it's really in the backwater, and it's only because of some of the political things that are in the background that it really took off. Now, I mentioned several times that in October of 1517 was when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the uh, castle church at Wittenberg. Most of these had to do with the sale of indulgences. And at that time, the people who were selling the indulgences were scraping a lot off for themselves. It really was a corrupt, corrupt practice. But Martin Luther was concerned about the theology of, of this more than he was the corruption of just uh, some people getting the commissions off of this. Uh, and so when you, if you, you know, most of you can get on the internet and look at what the 95 theses were. When you read through them, they're not really anything that would shock you at this point in time. And he kept on saying, if the Pope knew about this, he wouldn't let this go on. So it was pretty mild stuff, and it was in Latin. This is something that they debated in universities. This is how they, they had like, like a little debating uh, uh, societies and stuff. This was not meant to generate a revolution or uh, strike down Catholicism or anything else. But what happened was somebody took those 95 theses written in Latin that Martin Luther had and he translated them to German and spread them around the population. So it really wasn't Martin Luther's intent to get all this started, but uh, it went downhill from there. If you think about when the Protestant Reformation really got started, it was really uh, about the, um, uh, in 1521, when Martin Luther was condemned as a heretic by the Pope, uh, and also by Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. But Martin Luther was in Saxony. What became Germany and what was at that time the Holy Roman Empire, it was broken up into electorates. Saxony was one of them, and Frederick, who was sort of the prince there, was supported by the French. And so when Charles V went to arrest Martin Luther at the direction of the Pope, uh, Frederick the Wise is what he was called at the time, Frederick of Saxony, said, you know, we've got, uh, we've got the right to rule ourselves here. We don't want you in here. And by the way, the French are backing me up. And at the time, Charles V didn't want to have a war on his hands. He had lots of, lots of problems as it was. And by the way, Charles V had lots of disputes with the papacy and actually sacked Rome in 1527. And that sacked by Charles V's army and some disgruntled Spaniards and with his army were also some Lutherans. That, that sack of Rome was said to be worse than what the Vandals did. So we're talking about, and by the way, he took the Pope. This is the main leader of, a Catholic, of the Catholic Roman Empire, and he essentially put the Pope in jail. So these political uh, machinations that are going on at the time is what allowed Martin Luther to continue to talk and continue to teach and kind of let things keep going. Here's what Martin Luther's theology developed into. As I told you already, there was a large interest in eschatology, the, the idea that this is the end of the world. Uh, so people were very interested in trying to get saved right away. And the story is that Martin Luther was reading the uh, letter to the Romans, uh, and he came across this part where it said, uh, the just man shall be saved by his faith. And Martin Luther, because he was in a observantine uh, group and you know he was a type of guy that you know if you're supposed to go to confession once once a month he'd go three times a month you know and if you're supposed to say the rosary five times he'd say it ten times so but he never got satisfied doing those things and so when he when this phrase from the letter to the Romans uh, impacted him all of a sudden all of that pressure that you know he couldn't ever do enough was sort of released. And so the idea of justification by faith alone, you know, you can't earn your way into heaven. You can do all of the sacraments and do all the good works that you want, uh, 
but that's not going to improve your chances for salvation. That was kind of the key idea of Martin Luther's uh, theology. What went along with this uh, was sola scriptura. That is, uh, if it isn't in scripture, then it's not valid. Uh, Martin Luther thought that uh, over the course of millennium, hundreds and hundreds of years, there is an accretion of all sorts of traditions that really had no basis in, in real Christianity because you couldn't find it in the Bible. His attitude was, if it's not in the Bible, it's A, not true, or not very important, one of those two things. So the second thing was, if it, it is scripture that tests the church, not the other way around. Um, the next section for his theology is that, you know, the idea of a hierarchy. Are priests better than common people? And remember, this folded right into the anti-clericalism that was already kind of out in society. So, uh, the idea is that nobody can mediate God's grace. This is a free gift from God directly, and uh, we really don't need priests to do that. The job of the minister is to proclaim God's word. Okay, the next thing is the priesthood of all believers, and that goes right along with it. There shouldn't be any hierarchy, there shouldn't be any separation. The only thing that the clergy should do is be well educated in scriptures and they should spread that. And lastly, that this goes along with justification by faith alone. Uh, the sacraments, you have to look at the scriptures and there's only two sacraments really that count. Uh, and be, that's because you can find them in scriptures. And those two sacraments would be baptism and Eucharist. And I thought this was really interesting because for Eucharist, the description that distinguished Luther from Catholicism was that he described the Eucharist as consubstantial as opposed to transubstantial that we use. Okay? Um, and we use consubstantial in, in the creed now in a, in a different description. But it was Martin Luther's idea that consubstantial showed up in the early formulations, uh, and that should be the word used, and transubstantiation was from Aristotle. And so, therefore, it wasn't in Scripture, and so it wasn't the right idea to think about the Eucharist. All right. These were things that I, I picked up that I thought were really good arguments that I hadn't heard before uh, or heard in different terms that I found less convincing. These are the responses, the arguments, so to speak, that Catholicism had against Lutheranism and particularly against the Protestant Reformation. The first one goes to Luther himself. It goes like this. Here is Martin Luther in Wittenberg population 5,000. What's the likelihood that after a millennium and a half of church doctors, of theologians, of saints, that some guy in the backwater of Saxony is going to come up with the right formulation of theology superior to all of the tradition, all of the education, all of the scholarship, and all of the influence of the Holy Spirit through those times? Right? This was the criticism of Luther that he himself said bothered him the most. All right? Why would it be that he would come up with this formulation after all those generations of scholars? And I think that's a pretty good argument. The next argument was, you know, all of society is based on these relationships. The relationship, the hierarchy uh, that is reflected in society at this time. And once you take away that those ideas as to how society should be formed, there's going to be all sorts of political problems then. There's going to be all sorts of sub subversions and it's going to destabilize society. And that's exactly what happened. Shortly after Martin Luther, there was something called the Peasants' War. And in Germany, there was a revolt by the peasants. They went around to the aristocrats' estates and killed a bunch of them, and there was, a, there was a bunch of terrorism that went on there. And it was brutally suppressed eventually by, uh, you know, uh, by the aristocrats. But it, it seemed to come right after the Martin Luther had spread his, uh, his teaching in that area. The, the third argument is that 
you know, once you take away these things that we've believed for so long, what's going to happen is that if you let everybody figure, figure for themselves what the truth is, there'll be as many truths as there are people figuring it out. You know? And when you look at the list of, of denominations within Protestantism, you know, first the, the uh, Lutherans divided from the Catholics, and then from the Lutherans, then there was the Calvinists. Completely different theology, based on the same scripture. Well, if truth is one, how can you have that? And they're all claiming that we have the capital T truth. And then, of course, there were the Anabaptists and endless uh, you know, denominations that developed with different ideas as to what scripture actually said. So that's one, another argument that was presented. Uh, yet another argument is, you know, precedence is to law what tradition is to Christianity. And I can tell you as a lawyer that, you know, when I want to say that something has been the law for a long time, it's black letter law, this is the way we've always done it, that has force. It has the force of law. That's how we run the courts, that's how, how we run law. And the same thing is true about traditions. If you have a religious tradition, that you've had for hundreds and hundreds of years, that carries a lot of force uh, because it's provided faith to an awful lot of Christians um, and one would assume that that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay, and the last argument is, you know, if you go by faith alone, what are most people's practical reactions going to be to that? Well, the practical reaction is, if I'm saved by faith alone, what motivation have I got to do anything good? You know, what, what is it that is going to keep me from doing bad things if I'm saved by my faith alone? I don't have to worry about the negative, and I don't have to worry about doing things positive either. So those are the arguments, essentially, that were asserted. Catholic hierarchy had uh, a different approach to Luther. First of all, they had had a long history of different heretical movements. Uh, they had all passed away eventually. And they felt that if you actually debated these people, then you admitted that there was something to debate. And so they weren't very aggressive uh, in some ways, uh, in one, especially once Luther was condemned, they didn't want to do any more debates because that would admit there were still issues to be resolved. One of the feelings was that, you know, if you give unsophisticated lay people uh, and let them choose what to believe, uh, then, uh, you know, you're, you're just going for a propaganda war. And that shouldn't be used. Uh, people should, you know, should listen to the experts about what they should believe. Um, and this goes right along with the other thing, and that is the response by the hierarchy was they got scholars to write really good theological tractates in Latin. This was a big tactical error. The um, number of publications by the Protestants directed to lay people outnumbered the Catholic response five to one. And because of that, because there wasn't any response that was directed to lay people, it was directed to um, people who were well-educated, kind of elites, uh, then lots of people didn't get what, uh, what they should have as far as the counter-arguments. All right, so what was going on for Catholic reform? The, uh, within the church that was already going on, the idea that reception of sacraments, especially penance and communion, should be more frequent. That was already an ongoing reform within Catholicism at this time period. There are more participations in pilgrimages and processions and saint celebrations and stuff like that. That was going on at the time. There was more lay interest in these things. Um, there was an increase in contributions and uh, membership to confraternities. And as I said, what these were, they were lay organizations that took care of the sick, the lepers, the poor, the condemned, they did teaching. Uh, there was something called the Oratory of Divine Love started in Genoa and really spread out it, it took care of uh, sick people, and this was really a popular form of Catholicism, and it showed that people were really committed to their faith at that time. 
After uh, the Reformation got started, both from the Protestant standpoint and the Catholic standpoint, there was an actual attempt to bring the two parties together. This happened in a place called Regensburg in 1541. Moderates from both factions got together there. Uh, I'll talk in the second half this, uh, of this evening uh, about the people who were actually there on the Catholic side. But Luther's right-hand man was there. They actually worked out a compromise formula for the doc doctrine of justification. But this had been, now been 20 years, and they couldn't agree on should the pope have any power, should he have anything to say about uh, doctrine when it came in conflict with scripture, uh, what were the number of the sacraments. And so the, the meeting fell apart. What eventually happened was something called the Schmalkaltic War, which was essentially the Holman, Holy Roman Emperor versus the uh, princes in, in Germany from the various uh, places like Saxony and so, so forth. It was Protestant versus Catholic. And on the other end of it, there was the movement to begin to have a council to see if the Catholic Church couldn't respond to this, uh, both from a doctrine standpoint and from a standpoint of reforming the hierarchy. Right, now we're at the uh, Council of Trent proper. Um, let me go into just a little bit how it came to pass uh, that an ecumenical council was actually called. Early in the 16th century, the popes didn't want to have a church council. And of course, you can imagine with the councils before and with complaints about the Roman, uh, the pope's actual um, court, uh, that being the center, they were afraid that they were going to take away the power and so forth, or they were going to limit the uh, authority. So the popes at the time put that off. Um, there was disagreements as to where this was going to be held. Remember, Italy, there were papal states. And the, of course, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, was afraid that if the council was held in Italy, the pope would, would totally dominate uh, the, the council. There would be a lot of discussion about theology. The Holy Roman Emperor had lots of Protestants and didn't want to you know, cause problems, you know, throw gas on that fire. And so, uh, although the Pope wanted to have the council in Italy, the Holy Roman Emperor wanted to dominate the thing himself. And so he wanted to have the council someplace in the Holy Roman em Empire. And of course, the French, the Valois French, they were afraid that the Holy Roman Emperor would actually solve the problem if a council was held. That was not in their political interest because they wanted problems for the Holy Roman Emperor. So they, they, uh, they vacillated back and forth, but there are more, more on the pope side as to where this should be held. So the first movement to actually get the council going was in the mid-1530s. Uh, eminent cardinals were asked by Pope Paul III to draft an agenda in 1535. This was called the Concilium de Amendanda Ecclesia. And this was done essentially by Cardinal Contarini. Now, Dr. Cardinal Contarini, he was one of the spirituali in Italy during the Renaissance. This guy was one of the guys who was at Regensburg. This was a really influential uh, cardinal who was truly interested in the internal reformation of the church from the inside out. And so he was one of the ones who actually put this agenda together. And it did not pull any punches. It was really critical of the fiscal abuses that had been going on in the papal court. It was very critical about absentee clergy, how that was undermining the laity and the religious and spiritual values of the, of the church. Um, but it was so negative that Pope Paul III decided not to publish it. He thought that was more diplomatic. But somebody from the other camp, the Lutherans, got a hold of it and published it in Germany and said, here's the church criticizing itself. What further proof do you need? So 
Eventually, it, it took about 10 years before the Council of Trent was actually called. Now, I have up there the little graphic of nuts and bolts, so these are the essential facts that you need to know. It was called by Pope Paul III. Uh, he was the one uh, who put the council together initially. There are three periods within which this council uh, met, and it was about over the course of 18 years. Now, uh, some scholars say, you know, if the popes weren't so domineering and authoritarian, the Council of Trent would have gotten a lot more done. But the other side of the coin is that it was a really, really a triumph of papal diplomacy to continue the reform process to make it effective, even with wars in between, another outbreak of the plague in between, and all sorts of problems. So there are 25 sessions over these three periods, and I have the years up there. Now, uh, Trent was actually, it was a city at the time inside the Holy Roman Empire, but not by much, and it was culturally Italian, so it was sort of a, a compromised place. The first two group sessions, and I mean, uh, from 1545 to 47 and 1551 to 52, these were dominated by doctrine. That is, Pope Paul got his way and the definition, the identity of Catholics through their doctrine were worked out in those two first long sessions. Charles V didn't get his reform of the papal court until the third uh, session between 1562 and 63. By that time, he had given the Holy Roman Empire uh, to his two sons, um, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute or two. But the things that were decided by Trent were approved unanimously by all of the bishops as well as the Pope. So they were successful in actually getting some reformation and getting agreements as what should be done. I just put this uh, up there. That is actually the place where Trent took place. And you can see on the map where Trent is. Uh, in Italian, it's called Trento, so that's a current thing. But at, at the time, this was in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and you can see from the picture of Trent in the countryside, it's pretty isolated. All right? uh, and it was said that you know, in past councils, the Holy Spirit came down and influenced the council. Uh, but in this circumstance, uh, the inspiration came from Rome in a mailbag. So uh, there was some truth to that. Pope Paul and the uh, other popes that were um, present, or, or I should say, uh, in Rome at the time, they didn't actually uh, conduct the actual uh, Council of Trent, but watched it very carefully uh, and had diplomats going back and forth almost daily. <laughs> All right. The agenda for the Council of Trent was in two parts. It was, a, it was a response for the Reformation. Extirpation of heresies was number one. That is a redefinition of Catholic doctrine. And then reform of morals. That is to say, the institutional problems that had gone wrong that I explained in the first half, those would be addressed. But what really came out of the Council of Trent was a new style of Roman Catholicism that was much more directed to individual uh, spirituality to get people to understand what their faith was about. It was focused on the clergy. The idea was if you have good bishops, you'll have good priests. If you have good priests, you'll have good people. And the idea was to actually serve the better spiritual uh, values of the church. I love the graphics on this but it, because I can picture that mass as I stand here right now. I'm the altar boy on the right, by the way. Um, but I want to put these graphics up before I put the text up because um, we think of the Tridentine Mass as something that came out of the Council of Trent. And there was also the Catechism of the Council of Trent. But you should know that neither of those things actually came out of the Council of Trent. These were things that came after and were developed after the Council of Trent, but in the spirit of Council of Trent. 
the catechism for the Council of Trent is much different than the, than the um, catechism we have from Vatican II. It was directed not for the people, but rather for the priests and clergy so that they could authoritatively teach the laity. So once again, the emphasis of this was a reform of the hierarchy and the clergy. Okay, number one, Catholic reform and counter-reformation. The reformation, first of all, of the institutions, practices, and as I said, this was directed at the clergy. Their first job was to define what was orthodoxy. Justification and what that consisted of was one of their main topics. The second topic for what did it mean to be Catholic from a belief standpoint was the idea of scripture and tradition and what was authoritative. And last but very importantly, what were the sacraments really sustained by scripture? Were they really something that was necessary? All right. The first of those things, and I'll go over this because I think you're probably pretty familiar with it, but these were things that were actually decided and declared at Trent, was justification. The council uh, and the pope spoke very clearly, and they said, faith is absolutely required. You are dependent on God's grace. But that's not the only thing that brings you justification. You have to respond to that grace. I think uh, Father Jaime gave a, a sermon a couple weeks ago. I was very struck by it because he said, you have to be the best you can be to bring that grace of God to wherever you are, as an adult, as a spouse, as a parent, as a worker, whatever your environment is, your job as a layperson is to take that grace and make it active. And that's what the Council of Trent said. It said that you must cooperate. Human beings don't just take grace of God and are passive, and they're either saved or not saved, depending on how God has preordained it. You have free will. You can do good, or you can do evil. And it's up to you. And that's how you're justified. This is a cooperation between God's free gift of grace to you and what you do with it, all right? So uh, it wasn't, as uh, Calvin was saying, it was not a one-way imputation of righteousness to people who were totally corrupt and couldn't respond. You have dignity as human beings, and you exercise free will. Uh, so to remember that, I think, is really important. The debate between uh, solo scriptura uh, and the idea of tradition. Of course, the Council of Trent declared that scripture and tradition are both equally necessary and both equally authoritative. They pointed out uh, that there was a canon of scripture and it was different than what the Protestants were saying. The canon of scripture included what Protestants usually call the Apocrypha. That is, Tobit, Judith, Maccabees, and so forth. These are the te texts that are originally written in Greek, not in Hebrew, but form part of the Old Testament in our canon of Scripture. The Council of Trent also said that uh, Jerome's translation, the so-called Latin Vulgate, was authoritative. It was fine for sermons, for lectures, uh, for liturgies, and so forth. And this was something that was being attacked uh, from the Protestant side. And this is really important, that scripture does not interpret the church, but rather the church interprets exclusively scripture. Well, let's, let's think about that. Is there scriptural support for that? And the answer to that is if you look in the Gospel of John, uh, John 21 says, there are also many other things that Jesus did, but if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. Doesn't that suggest that there's more than what's written down that's important for people's spirituality? And again in John, 
Gospel of John, Jesus says himself, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. So right out of scripture, right out of the gospel of John, Jesus is saying, you know, there's more to it than what I can tell you. You will get further revelation as time goes on. So it's right in scripture. And of course, once again, I can't resist being a lawyer a little bit, but there's always the, the idea first in time, first in right. What came first, the church or scripture? Remember, we didn't have a canon of what scripture consisted of until the year 367. All right? So if the church preceded scripture and actually determined what the scripture was going to be, isn't it inconsistent to say scripture is going to be the judge of the church? Okay, so those are the, those are the arguments. Uh, not surprisingly, the Council of Trent said that there's a scriptural basis for each of the seven sacraments. I actually went uh, and Googled that, and you can, you can find the scriptural basis for all of the sacraments. Uh, but I think from that context uh, at that time, there was an argument that, you know, we had all of these corrupt clergy, we had people being ordained by people who, you know, were, were corrupt themselves. Are those people valid and so forth? Remember when Professor Noble was here, he talked about what was going on in North Africa during some of those heresies. And how we got the name of Catholic is that it was an insult originally. The, uh, the people who had apostatized in North Africa during a, a severe um, test, the question was, was, should they be allowed to be back in the church? Some of them were clergy. When they gave sacraments after they did that, were those sacraments valid? And the opponents said, no, I mean, they're corrupt. How can they give grace or be channeled for grace? And, but the, the idea that prevailed was that there was always uh, a place for forgiveness, there's a place for people to come back to the church, and the opponents of that said, oh, well, you're Catholic, you'll let anybody in. And so that's how, one of the reasons why we actually call ourselves Catholic. So that came up at the Council of Trent as well. That is, if you have uh, either the recipient or somebody who's giving a, a sacrament uh, that's corrupt or has, you know, isn't perfect, is it still effective? Are those sacraments effective? And the Latin phrase ex opere operato was the answer. That is, the thing operates in and of itself. It has an innate virtue. This is God acting. It's not coming from the human beings. This is God working through human beings. All right. So that, that's effective regardless of the state of the minister or the recipient, as long as they have the right attitude. Okay. Now, as far as institutional reform, the papal court really did get some popes that followed that were really interested in improving the moral to tone of their own court. They insisted not only on real moral upstanding themselves, but the cardinals in Rome were held to a much stricter uh, canon uh, and uh, behavior, behavioral rules. The popes actually thought, thought of themselves thereafter as pastors of the universal church instead of Renaissance you know, uh, rulers of city-states. Uh, they did something real, the popes did something really smart. And what, what they did was that they co uh, created congregations. These were committees of cardinals uh, before it was just one consistory. And, and people sort of ad hoc took jobs and so forth. Uh, but the popes at this period of time, after Trent, had c committees and the cardinals had duties that they were supposed to follow up uh, and they were supposed to be responsible for those. The reason why this was a good idea was because there was always jockeying for power within the consistory. And when you gave cardinals and groups specific tasks, they would be judged then on how effective they were in those tasks. 
And from a political standpoint, what happened was European governments started to follow exactly that pattern. That's where the Europeans got the idea of bureaucratized government. You, you seg segregate different departments of the government to do specific tasks, and that was actually something that had an effect in politics thereafter in Europe. And by the way, it had the effect of reducing, of course, the political power of the consistory so that they wouldn't uh, be competing with the pope for power. Further on institutional reforms, uh, the papal court, as I said, really became models and encouraged implementation of Trent. Now you have to think, remember I talked about the uneven nature of how Christianity was lived before Trent and before the, the Reformation. That is, it depended on your local area. In Germany, it might be different than in France, or in Italy, or in the big cities, or in the country. The urban bishops after Trent really did a pretty good job of implementing Trent. They got seminaries started, they started visiting the parishes more and having synods and stuff like that. But there were a lot of people, and you know, the further you get away from Rome, the harder it is to control things. Remember, this is not a time when you have an internet, you don't have railroads, you don't have airplanes, and, and it's really difficult to control things politically the farther out you get. So there were a number of areas where the rural bishops, because they are local aristocrats, tried to maintain the old forms, but that eventually uh, faded away, but it took a long time. The uh, institutional reforms once again, the idea was that the patronage system was turned actually to make Rome a center for Catholicism, uh, not uh, a center for corruption. And so they really concentrated on making Rome a center uh, for the, the worldwide church. They were really successful at this too. The architecture, the art, and so forth was all directed towards making things more spiritual. They were all uh, you know, there were ma many more things that were really concentrated on inspiring people, and Rome became, once again, a place where people went for pilgrimage. Before that, remember when the popes were in Avignon, you know, that was really bad for, for Rome, because if the, the pope wasn't there and the papal business, business wasn't there, people weren't staying there, they weren't eating there, and it was really, there was really e an economic depression in Rome as a result of that. But after Trent, when they made Rome a center for Catholicism and people were coming back, um, in the year 1575, after Trent, more than 400,000 visitors came to Rome. Now when you think about the transportation difficulties in Europe at that time, to have 400,000 people visit, that is really astronomical. And it was just about this time that the catacombs were rediscovered. So, you know, people could come and see the place where the old ancient heroes of Catholicism, of Christianity, had died and been martyred. And this was a big deal. This was like refreshing, uh, you know, the very source of, of Catholicism. That hierarchical structure was reinforced uh, and the idea was you don't want to break down the hierarchy because then you'll get that fragmentation that happened in the Protestant movement. So that was reinforced. Uh, but the idea was if you have a good pope, you'll have good bishops. And if you have good bishops, you can have good priests. And that, it's almost like a trickle-down theory. Okay, what were the reforms? Well, the idea that a bishop or priest could go around and be absent from where they're supposed to be, uh, that was changed. You, had to be, you couldn't become an ad hoc bishop for, with no territory, and priests were actually dedicated and ordained for particular churches. Uh, this idea that uh, Professor Noble mentioned again, this diocesan synods and visitations by the bishop, once again, that was mentioned as something important, but it actually started to get done. Uh, most of these reforms were aimed at the clergy, and one of the most important thing was the systematic training of priests for the first time. Every diocese was required to have a seminary, and you know seminary means, means seedbed. The idea was that if you grow the, these priests uh, from an early age and you 
teach them how to be spiritual and how to minister to the laity, you'll have much better priests. So uh, that was the focus. It wasn't just to have seminary or seminarians who were well educated. The idea was they knew the theology, they knew how to preach, they knew spiritual guidance, and this was uh, directed for the laity. All right. I talked about seminaries here uh, and the idea that the priests themselves were supposed to have very high standards of personal behavior in contrast to the prior period. Now, I have a picture. How many people recognize that picture? <laughs> or you won't raise your hands. I know you recognize that from the Bells of St. Mary. That very idea of Bing Crosby and, and the flavor that he had, we might think of it as kind of saccharine these days, but that idea of somebody above reproach somebody above parity. That came for the Council of Trent. The idea of, of behavior that was an example rather than a scandal to people was one of the spirits that came out of Trent and really influenced the Catholic Church for a long time. Okay, now I mentioned that it makes a difference geographically where these things were being implemented. Unless you implement something from a council, it's just dead letter. So the post-Triantine reforms first really made impact in Spain and Italy. That's not too surprising. And it was only until uh, later that France, the Netherlands, and Eastern Europe were brought along. If you are interested in looking up on the internet some of the interesting people from this period, Carlo Borremo is somebody Bishop of Milan that you should look up. 1584, he had, uh, from uh, Milan, he had 3,000 priests, 800,000 parishioners, and he did such a good job in implementing the, the reforms from Trent, he actually got complaints all the way to the Vatican and they had to tell him, back off a little bit if you please. Uh, but he actually did a, a superb job with the seminaries, he reformed the colleges and monasteries and confraternities in his area. Um, I wish I had more time to talk about him, but really this is one of the stars uh, of the, the period of time. All right. I mentioned before that there were religious orders that were developed and were developing even before Trent. Um, the idea was one of the institutional reforms is that if you belong to a religious order and you're supposed to be at a monastery, then you should stay there. One of the problems was that uh, people joined orders and then they went off, they came back and, they, uh, and so forth, back and forth quite a bit. There were a number of new orders that developed. The Jesuits were among them. And I'll talk about them in a, in a minute. But there were the Reformed Carmelites in Spain, uh, Teresa of Avila, of course, you probably know something about her from a certain place close to our hearts in town. All right. Um, there were other uh, developments in religious orders. Uh, the Capuchins, they were developed. Uh, that was a second ob observatine uh, development from uh, the Franciscans. Um, and they actually went back to the original order of St. Francis and were permitted to uh, do the service for the poor and the sick uh, that Francis had talked about. Ursulines is a teaching order, so there are all sorts of developments in the uh, religious order groups. Now I mentioned to you something about the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. This was really kind of the shock troops of the Catholic Church uh, that came out of Trent. There, this was a new flexible ministry. They were actually allowed not to do the, the seven times a day prayers that uh, most priests are required to do. They were uh, allowed to be more flexible in how they ministered to people. You probably know that the um, founder of that order is Ignatius Loyola. Um, and he's probably most famous for the spiritual exercises. People use that even today for spiritual guidance. Uh, they take an additional vow of obedience to the Pope. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we were at a uh, 
Shakespearean play this past weekend. That play came out, it was Julius Caesar, it came out in 1599. When it was first performed in London, about three blocks from there, they were executing Jesuits already. So, you know, this kind of puts it in, in time, but it, these are the kinds of, uh, they were really uh, very effective, and of course they were effective not only in Europe, but they were sent to the New World uh, and to missions abroad as well. This was a new development to spread Catholicism. All right. Now, how did the, the secular leaders feel about the Council of Trent? Well, you know, I, I said before that it was implementation that was really the key here. Uh, Philip of Spain, he was uh, um, a post-Trent guy who said, well, the Trentine reforms shall not infringe on my royal rights. All right, That kind of left him a big loophole, obviously. And so there continued to be problems, frictions between uh, the secular world and, and the church. Uh, even in Spain, one of the, the leading Christian powers, uh, not only in Europe, but also in the New World. The French, of course, had ha always had a tradition of the Gallican liberties, uh, and they were very wary of any kind of consular degree, decrees, and so there were resistance uh, from the King of France there. All right. Uh, what happened with the laity after Trent? The laity continued uh, to be very active and actually increased and were inspired by the Council of Trent. It's estimated that within 10 years of, of the end of Trent, that publication of all materials in Europe, 48% of the publications were concerning Catholic life, catechisms, prayer books, lives of the saints, and so forth. In other words, almost half of printed material following Trent went to lay people's spirituality. Increasingly active confraternities. I mentioned to you that before the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation, uh, these confraternities were already expanding and were important for lay Catholic life. That continued after Trent. Uh, they continued to make contributions to refurbished churches and fund other lay ministries. Now, I wouldn't, wouldn't be totally honest with you if I said, well, all lay people did a great job after Trent. There are many lay people after Trent, especially in the rural areas, who felt that this was an attack on their culture. They really didn't want to be told that what they were doing was superstitious. They didn't want to be told that you can't go to the bar across the street after mass and get drunk on Sundays or Saints days. Uh, and that had been their, their tradition for a long time. So there was resistance to this new spirit of Trent, even from the laity. All right. What I wanted to get across to you tonight was that there was, there's been research recently, and it looks very much as if the Catholic institutions, both in devotions and practice, were really becoming focused, particularly in, with the laity, in getting enlivened individuals to making religiosity more internal and to get people to actually understand what the doctrines were. This seems to be something that is central to the Catholic Reformation period and the Council of Trent. All right. So, what do we learn? These are the things that I'd like you to take from here and to think about. We know, and we, we've heard it from the bishop, We've heard it from Professor Noble, and I hope you've heard it from me here tonight, that times of crisis and challenge are not to be viewed as negatives. Oftentimes, those are the very times that yield clarity of our most fundamental and deeply held beliefs. We have to articulate what we believe in the face of those challenges and conflicts. Second. Renewal and reform is an ongoing process. There isn't a time in the Catholic Church when there isn't a renewal and reform movement going. This is something that's essential for us, change, deeper spirituality, learning about our faith. That's what keeps us going. 
and it, what, it's what makes us effective in our environments. The third thing, and something that came as a surprise as I was preparing this talk, was the laity as individuals and groups were an essential source of spiritual strength for the church in this time period. We usually hear about only you know, what was going on with the Pope's uh, court, all the scandals and all that stuff. That's what you usually hear when I went through school and I bet when you went through school and it's still out there in society today. Be aware that the Catholic laity at that time was active and alive and a source of strength that's continued and was really inspired after Trent as well. Here's something that's really important for us in a different context. When you think of all the scandal, all of the, the abuse, all of the financial problems, um, what even in the Pope's court and himself was, was doing, those most serious errors of individuals and groups within the church did not undermine the foundational values of committed people. This is something that regardless of what scandal you may, you may hear, it does not change and it did not, it did not change historically the strengths that people hang on to and make them competent to live their lives as Catholics um, then or now. And lastly, I'm all for, and I really kind of was inspired by uh, retreats, that, that spiritual experience that you get occasionally in your life. But I think what really keeps you going is learning about what your faith means and keeping that growing, like you're here doing tonight. All right. All of the facts that you learn may be different than what you thought before. Uh, and there may be aspects that you never thought about before. And that's why, you know, Pope Benedict asked us to look at the uh, documents from the Second Vatican Council this year. And I urged you to look primarily, if you don't look at any other ones, look at that apostolate of the laity because that is written for you. And you can see that things in some of those other Vatican II documents that we talked about tonight, uh, how it was treated in Trent and how it was treated in the Vatican II. So with that, I'll remind you that next week uh, we've got uh, another real star and real teacher, Professor Lawrence uh, Cunningham, PhD, Notre Dame Theology Department. Uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, hit one of his specialties is church history, and he's going to be talking about Vatican I and how the church responded to the uh, challenge of the modern age. So I hope, I, I really appreciate you being here tonight. I hope you uh, got something out of it, and I hope to see you here next week for the final uh, session in The Long Road to Vatican II. Thanks. <laughs>